Good evening, everyone, and welcome to SPIF Film Talk. I'm Mickey Desdovich, Senior Programmer at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And tonight's film, we're going to discuss The Haunted Swordsman. This is an amazing film, and our guest tonight is the director and pep puppeteer, uh, Kevin McTurk. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Mickey, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this talk. I'm, I'm thrilled. Awesome. Um, Kevin, I want to, we normally don't do this, but you have such an interesting career in, um, in movie uh, monster making and creations and sets and puppeteering. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your career? Sure, sure. So I am originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I was a, uh, always loved working, uh, shooting Super 8 films. My, my parents, uh, always brought this great camera on our family vacation. So I was always, uh, my mother and sister, we were always making uh, short films on family vacations. I, I had various jobs in high school and I was an ice cream truck driver in a parking alley. Um, one summer I uh, decided to try to work in a, you know, closer to a film industry job. And uh, I learned of an effects guy, Tom Savini in Pittsburgh, who is, works with George Romero and uh, I met Tom and I interned for him for a summer and uh, got my start in effects in Pittsburgh. And then uh, I made, I finished film school and I went to Penn State and uh, studied film there. And then uh, the summer after I graduated, I drove out to Los Angeles. And the first week I was in LA, I got hired by Stan Winston uh, on Batman Returns. So. That was my start uh, building mechanical penguins for Batman Returns. I went on to work on the three Jurassic, the first three Jurassic Park films, and I puppeteered on all three of those, and uh, then puppeteered on Interview with a Vampire and Galaxy Quest, and and then years later I was on uh, Peter Jackson's King Kong. So over the years I, I've built puppets for many films and have. Uh, worked in the industry, uh, you know, creating makeup effects, but also building puppets. Awesome. It's so, it's so cool where, how far you've come. And it's, this short really shows um, your creativity and it's, it's amazing. And I, I would like to now um, actually talk to you a little bit about how the Haunted Swordsman even came about. Sure, sure. So I had been, you know, I've been working for many years, uh, building puppets for other films for these big blockbusters and I wanted to return to my uh, filmmaking roots. So I uh, learned about a grant offered by Heather Henson, who is Jim Henson's youngest daughter. And so in 2011, I uh, applied for a grant um, with her, her film series is called uh, Handmade Puppet Dreams. And uh, I made my, I was awarded the grant and I made my sh first short film, which was called The Narrative of Victor Carlock. Uh, back in 2011. And uh, then that uh, played festivals and toured. And then I decided to go uh, apply for a Kickstarter project. Uh, so my second film was The Mill at Calder's End. And I, um, I had a Kickstarter campaign for that and raised about $65,000 for that and was able to um, uh, make that as a puppet film that was a like a Victorian ghost story and uh it had its world premiere at a uh, Santa Barbara Film Festival so yeah. th thank you you're welcome and, um, and that played festivals and uh you know each film I had a, a better budget and I could afford better lighting and camera and uh spend more f money on the puppets and so by the third film I went back to Kickstarter and I raised about a hundred and thirty thousand dollars and uh was able to make this uh this samurai ghost story puppet film with uh, with an amazing cast and crew and uh, build incredible sets and the puppets were very high tech. And uh, it was a, just a blast to make. And uh, um, I should say, after I finished Miller Calder's End, I, um, I was screening the film at uh, the Jim Henson uh, lot here in Los Angeles. And a friend of a friend uh, approached me after the screening and his name's Tab Murphy and he, he's a screenwriter and he said whatever you're doing next I'd love to work with you and, and write the next one and Tab is an amazing Oscar nominated uh, screenwriter he wrote Gorillas in the Mist and a lot of uh, 
Disney films in the uh, 80s and 90s, um, uh, Brother Bear and Hunchback of Notre Dame and um, Beauty and the Beast. Um, and so I am, uh, I think Beauty and the Beast, uh-oh, Atlantis. I know some other films. Um, and uh, so I started bouncing ideas off uh, Tab and we came up with the, the story and uh, that was, it was a wonderful uh, partnership. Awesome. Um, and I want to, um, speaking of the story, this film really plays like a, a tribute to Kuros uh, Kurosawa samurai uh, movies, which is awesome. But it also has a hint of a road movie, which you wouldn't expect because you have a samurai with a severed head being his like com communicable buddy along the yeah. way. Can you talk a little bit about the creation of that story? Yes, we, we kind of knew. So the way I kind of was uh, warning Tab as we were writing it, um, I, I said, it's really difficult to animate the puppets because the way they're made, they're, they're kind of, you know, the faces, they're like rigid castings. So the mouths don't move. And so we wanted to make sure the dialogue was very limited, but his sidekick, who is the severed head, was a animatronic head. And I can show you that right here. So this is the, this is the mechanical head. And so he has, he has mechanical jaw, he has eyebrow movement and he can blink and the eye can look around. So we were gonna, we decided to make him do all the talking and the <laughs> lead character would be just responding to him. And then in moments where the samurai did have to say dialogue, we did animate those moments. Um, a guy named Jonathan Banta animated the mouth movements. So, but we kept his dialogue very minimal in that way. And that way we uh, we had the navigator, the severed head, do most of the heavy lifting as far as dialogue. And um, with the samurai, the, the, that's uh, that you um, animated that his, because it's so seamless. I, this whole time I thought it was puppetry. Um, I had no idea that the mouth was animated. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, he, we designed him and I'll bring him over here too. Here we go. No. So three puppeteer, it took three puppeteers to operate him. And he basically has, you know, his head can look up and down and he, he can look right and left. And, but this is his fixed expression. And then we sculpted a, a second head okay. when he was in pain or when he was attacking. So this was used for certain shots. Um, but most of the time it was, it was done with this, this puppet so you know alone so uh he you know we we used him mostly as the uh the central puppet to use yeah that's so cool so um so what were each parts of um the puppeteer's job with with him uh did one handle the hands the sword movement and exactly exactly um ron binion with and eli presser were our two lead puppeteers and most of the time they were handling. So somebody would handle, um, there's a hole in the back and your yeah. hand goes in and they, one person is doing the head movement and they're usually doing one of the arms, the sword arm or the, the non-sword, the other hand. And uh, the other person is, who is doing the other hand and maybe carrying the weight of the body. And then we have a third puppeteer for when we need a full body shot where we have uh, the person on the heel operating the feet um yeah so what's it what's it like uh choreographing something like that because they all have to be perfectly synced for that yeah well these fortunately these guys are just a, a dream team to work with and um these they're just wonderful they they pick up the puppet and all of a sudden you're just looking at a, a living character and uh you know there's no breathing mechanism but you see just the way they're moving the shoulders it looks like he's breathing or, or uh, responding. They are able to really hit eye lines, which is just a, um, a real, a true skill that a puppeteer must master is to, to be able to like really hit an eye line perfectly. And these guys can do it. Now, most of the time I kept making the puppets on each puppet film bigger and bigger. So these are over three and a half feet tall. So you can really hide people behind them. Um, my first film, they were you know, maybe 28 inches and then 
you know, then they went up to 32 inches and then these are like 38 inches. So they kept getting bigger. So all three puppeteers have to hide behind the puppet in some way. I like to shoot without green screen and try to shoot in the real environment and uh, just use fog and darkness to hide the puppeteers um, to kind of, I did that as a budgetary uh, thing to cut down on all the rotoscoping of removing um, the puppeteers behind the puppet. So most of the time they were dressed in black and hiding in really awkward positions behind the puppets. Now, um, now with a story like this, uh, do you then take the story into a storyboard? Do you storyboard this at all or do you just shoot from the hip with it? Yes, no, absolutely storyboards. I, I had the great opportunity. I worked with a DP um, named Bennett Surf. And I met Bennett at a, um, I would, went to a camera um, trade show and he was demonstrating a camera uh, rig and he was just so amazing at, uh, you know, he's so dexterous with these um, camera, this certain camera rig called a Ronin. And after it, I said, I'm working on a samurai film. It's still about a year away, but uh, I'd love for you to shoot it. And uh, what we did, um, we would build the set and then about two weeks before the actual shoot, Ben and I would go out and just shoot all the angles as our storyboards. So we would just uh, have every angle, just, you know, no, no lighting, just, you know, holding the puppet in place. And came, we came up with all our storyboards that way. So it was just a wonderful technique so that when we arrived for the shoot day, it felt like we already shot it. We were just repeating all of the angles we knew we had to get to. And uh, speaking of Bennett, um, I want to talk a little bit about that opening scene because it's 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 so gorgeous and it tricked me at first. I didn't know what I was. I thought I, this is a real thing that we're going into. I thought you built sculptures and everything. Can you talk a little bit about how you shot that opening scene through the mountainside? Sure, sure. So uh, what we did was uh, the very first thing. Uh, it was the very first uh, day working with Bennett. We went out to a boulder field out in Simi Valley, California, with a rock climber um, who named Robin Sargon, who kind of looked like the samurai. And we had a, a samurai outfit for him. And he was an amazing climber. And we just had him climb on the rocks and we kind of uh, picked some angles and we had him in silhouette, you know, climbing. And he was only a couple of feet off the ground. And uh, then we gave that footage to uh, my friend, Steve Norrington. And Steve, I, I was gonna keep it very simple and just have it as a locked off shot um, of this little guy climbing up a boulder. And he, Steve was like, no, if we back the camera up about three miles, we can go through the mist and over these mountains and come all the way up to that footage you shot. And, uh, and we'll hide the transition in some fog. We'll have some fog roll by and then will be with uh, the real climber. And then the same day that we were filming Robin, we also brought the puppet out and matched the puppet on the same rock climbing up. Uh, and we turned the camera sideways uh, like the old Batman TV show um, and uh, they and had the puppet climbing up uh, the cliff like that. So it really was incredible. We didn't know what the final shot would look like. Um, it took Steve Norrington um, about four months of render time just to get all the layers uh, composited. So we really had to wait. And then uh, and then when he showed me the shot, it was incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such an amazing shot and it's such a great way to open the film. Um, I wanna talk also about the other sets used for, uh, for the film. Uh, a lot of them created, I'm, I'm guessing that you created them um, with your art department. Can you talk a little bit about uh, building such sets to fit such uh, miniature uh, puppets? Sure, sure. Um, a lot of them were, um, I discovered on my last film, Millet Calders, and even on the first film, that uh, the studios, Warner Brothers and Universal Studios, they sell plastic rock sheets that are four feet by eight feet that are all different rock patterns and they lock together like puzzle pieces and you can just buy these uh set piece these rock faces and they all lock together and you just hit it with some paint and suddenly you have tunnels and rocks so it's 
it's a lot of the same rocks over and over again, just kind of turned sideways or um, painted differently. Um, and then at the end, when the Oni, uh, there's an Oni, a giant who's chasing the samurai, there was actually a haunted house attraction in Los Angeles, like a walkthrough interactive haunted house that had a rock cave um, as part of the set and they were about to tear it down. So we were really on a, a tight deadline to shoot it. Um, but, and it was a very tight squeeze and I was worried that it was gonna be too tight, but it played to our advantage because the, the giant looks, he could barely, it, he could barely see um, yeah. in, the, in the costume. He's a wonderful guy, John Cody Fasano, a great uh, actor. He's a UCLA drama guy and uh, he could barely see in the mask and he's chasing after uh, the samurai. He looks like a big toddler because he's just kind of <laughs> crashing through this, this set. And, um, and it worked to our advantage that the cave was such a tight squeeze because he really just looked immense in the, in the cave. Now, um, that like, answered the question. I, yeah, no, we, it did. We ended that, up that, using a lot of the same rocks over and over. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. You, you tricked me. I had no idea it was the same. same. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, there's a scene with, with a witch and I want to know exactly how you set that up. So did you just speed up the, the camera for when she was to, when she races towards the samurai and stops? Like, it's such a like <laughs> amazing scene because you're just like, all of a sudden it's, she's coming out slowly and then she's right there. So that was um, a great moment because that was, we had a puppeteer, Adrian Leonard, who was, she was on a, a like a long skateboard on her stomach and the, and the, the puppet was mounted to the front of the skateboard. And she was just using rods. Um, she had rods on each of the elbows of the witch. So she was, she was getting pushed along and just kind of as fast as she could, like uh, driving the hands forward. And we just, that was kind of, it was sped up, but she was moving along pretty fast. We had to kind of catch her at the end of the, the, the take or she'd crash. Um, and, uh, it was wonderful. And then we just, um, it was just a lot of clever editing. Our editor, uh, Michael Falvalita, did some amazing cutting there where she just seemed so uh, suddenly right in the face of the samurai. And um, one of the voices in, in, the, in the film is a friend of the festival and friend of Santa Barbara, and that's uh, Mr. Christopher Lloyd. And how did you go about uh, getting Christopher Lloyd to voice the character for this? So uh, I've worked with, I met Christopher Lloyd. Um, years ago, I did a, um, it was a Halloween benefit for, it's a, it sounds really out there, but it was a benefit for um, vision impaired kids, like a Halloween show. And so I met with this guy who, a story, so strange. He's, <laughs> He is in scent technology. So, uh, so ride Disney rides that you go on and you smell yeah. gunpowder or oranges or that. This guy was in charge of the, the smells for these rides, these scents. And uh, he was going to, he wanted to do a Halloween performance where there were scents going out into this audience. And he wanted a ghost story, a fun ghost story told by someone. And I, I thought I'll get, I approached Christopher Lloyd's agent about this and you know an hour later they said oh he'll do it this is this sounds so cool so that was even I would say that's like 2009 and then when I did my first film Victor Carlock I approached him again and he did the voice for for that character and then we stayed in touch and years later um, he happened to be coming into the effects studio that I was in uh, to do a a life cast a head, they were going to do an impression of his head and we caught up and he said well let me know i want to do another voice and so i didn't even have the character really you know it wasn't really even written but you know we i said absolutely and uh so chris ended up doing the voice of of the black monk for that scene and it was just wonderful he's just uh very you know he asked how he should I do it like in a Shakespearean kind of ghost? I was like, that's perfect. So uh, he's wonderful. 
Yeah, he he has such a unique voice that it was it was very recognizable, but he adds his own little twist to it, so he is a different character. And I was just, uh, did you discuss with him, or did you just let him decide how he wanted to voice that character? He just he just came up with that that voice, and he didn't even know what the character would look like. So when he was at the festival, he he I was thrilled he came to the the festival to watch the the short. And he saw for the first time how the scene was, and he was just so thrilled with how the character turned out. So That's it was awesome. it was wonderful. <laughs> That's great. And um, you were working in uh, you've worked with um, in puppetry for a while now, and I'm just wondering how have things changed with the technology of puppets? Well, we we've I've noticed we've in the last couple of years we've really embraced 3D printing, so. A lot of part internal parts are now 3D printed parts where we'd have to kind of do a lot more woodworking to build an inner structure. And now we can um, build it in, in 3D and print out a part that fit, um, where we'd have to, before you'd have to carve, carve and carve and carve and the, the thing would lock in. Um, now, it, now it just locks in perfectly and you can kind of take parts neck mechanisms apart very easily. So I would say 3D printing is is the is uh, you know sort of the newest uh, innovation. We've also um, started scanning parts. So you could you could scan I'll, I'll use one of these guys. You could take you could take this face and scan it and then digitally change the expression and then output um, a computer, you know, a a resin print with a different expression. So instead of having a sculptor sculpt a whole new expression and go through all those steps, you can just print out a, a new uh, expression face. Nice. Um, that's, that's I just want to point out these wig. This is the wig. It keeps falling off, but yeah. all the wigs were made by Lynn Watson and, and hand tied. Just incredible. Um, but I only could afford one wig. So this wig would go on to the angry head. So <laughs> that's, you know, I had to kind of cut some corners to in that respect. And then um, I want to touch a little bit on the sound mix for the for the film itself um, and the music that is used. Um, a lot of um, wood, it sounds more like wood blocks, uh, instrumentals. Can you talk a little bit about the choice of that? that sure, sound? sure. This was uh, another chance to work with uh, my friend of, I'd say, 25 years, Will Thomas, and uh, just a wonderful friend, and he's a percussionist, so he is, um, he really jumped at the chance to do all the uh, taiko drumming, you know, all the, all the Japanese kind of percussion throughout, but then we didn't want to, we wanted to not do it just absolutely, um, uh, we didn't want to do it too spot on to uh we wanted to use some non-japanese instruments as well so there was a lot of cello in in the uh, film as well because we just thought uh i love cello it's just such a perfect somber uh instrument too and uh you know for him trudging and trekking uh, will came up with a he a long lead time to start um, uh, composing the music, he actually composed three or four choices for each scene. So we could kind of watch the scene play it one way, and then he had alternate, whole alternate tracks that we could try out. And then uh, my other favorite part is uh, at the end when the uh, Oni, the giant, shows up. We wanted to use something that was just like this jarring. Uh, horn. So it's actually like a Tibetan, one of those Tibetan horns yeah. that we had, uh, that he blasted. And then, uh, you know, that's the, that was the start of the Oni chasing him. Uh, yeah, it was just so much fun. That's amazing. And um, finally, I have to, I have to ask this because the end of the film, it kind of, kind of leaves room for more. Uh, is there a plan to try to have more? Because it kind of just cuts there and, and you're like, where is he going next on his adventure? And it has that beautiful um, painted scene in the back of, of, the, of the forest. Yes, yes. That was uh, a matte painting by Colin Maine, who uh, 
was up in Canada and, and did that painting uh, for me. And yes, absolutely. We've now Tab and I have um, written out, I think, seven more episodes. And so this is actually episode two of the eight store, eight episode storyline. Okay. So we have your, we kind of wanted to drop the viewer into like, you know, the second story instead of, because uh, we knew, you know, we, we wanted to just hit the ground running and uh, drop them into a story. So the first story introduces you to him discovering the, the severed head and uh, a little more of the backstory. And then, um, then the story continues on from there with his whole quest to find this sword. So um, yes, there is a lot. We're having a lot of uh, exciting uh, Zoom meetings with, with all sorts of big companies, but uh, nothing yet. We're just hoping to, um, you know, hear some good news soon. So uh, uh, yes, it's written. That, that's great. I look forward to uh, seeing the final product because it, it's such an amazing film. And I thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us uh, tonight. And I wish you the best of luck with uh, creating uh, that series of, of films. Thank you so much. And I, I'm such a big fan of the Santa Barbara Film Festival. It's, I had my world premiere of Millet Calder's End up there and uh, it's just a real special festival. Um, it's just it's a wonderful road trip up to LA to go to that festival. So I thank you for inviting me to, to talk tonight. Well, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your evening and we'll be in contact. Thanks, thanks. And uh, I guess if people wanna see my stuff, it's at um, thespiritcabinet.com. I have um, the other films uh, on there. So uh, um, that's, the, that's the website to find me. <laughs> All right, I recommend going there. He has, he has, his other films are amazing as well. All right, everyone, have a good night and we'll see you next week.